For someone who lives in Bristol, which the internet tells me is a whopping 11 metres above sea level, the idea of training at altitude or altitude training never really popped into my head. Yet that all changed when I had an email from the team at the Altitude Centre in London. Their request was pretty simple, come and try our equipment out and see what difference it makes. Good man, well picked up, good stuff. The conventional wisdom around altitude training is that you live or sleep high and then you train low. Living and sleeping high enables you to reap the red blood cell boosting benefits of altitude and then training low allows you to kind of push your body to the max at the higher oxygen levels you get at sea level. That's why teams like Team Sky go to places like Tenerife where they live high at Mount TD which is like 3,000 metres and then train lower around sea level to do all their hard training efforts. The Altitude Centre flipped this method on its head using shorter periods of training high at around 2,700 metres combined with your regular training at sea level and obviously living at sea level. While there's less scientific data to back up this style of training, the Altitude Centre claim that it will improve my oxygen efficiency at the lung and within the muscle, thus making me a more efficient rider. For any cyclist that's passionate about their training, racing and performance, this represents a tantalising proposition. Obviously, I'm not a scientist, so here's the official word from the Altitude Centre. Here we go. Exercising at altitude with reduced oxygen saturation in the blood means that the muscles have to become more efficient with what limited O2 is available to them. An increase in mitochondrial density and capillarization of the muscle helps to produce more energy and deliver more oxygenated blood to the deeper muscle, enabling you to work aerobically for longer and at higher intensities. Boom! <laughs> Obviously, living at Bristol means that I haven't got access to high altitudes, there's no mountains around. So in order to achieve the desired altitude, I was going to be using something called a hypoxic generator. That's basically a big grey box with a tube coming out of it with an oxygen mask on the end, which I'd strap on, and that would restrict the amount of O2 in the air that I was breathing through the mask. You use it when you're on the turbo, strap on the mask, fire up the generator and hey presto, you're riding at 2,700 metres. Just without the view, you're just going to be looking at whatever you're looking at in your different room. But before all the uh, painful fun started of using the hypoxia generator, I needed to get some baseline numbers from the Altitude Centre in London. The testing protocol we agreed on was going to be a relatively simple one. I'd do a series of physiological tests at simulated altitude at the Altitude Centre in London. Then two days later, once I recovered, I'd repeat these tests at sea level in Bristol. In order to make those tests as fair as possible, both would be conducted on a watt bike. I've got 195 heart rate, 88%, come on. Once the tests were complete, I would then use a hypoxic generator for six weeks and follow a training plan set by a third party. In this case, experienced coach and World Quebec Sea racer, Tom Bell. After those six weeks, it'd simply be a case of going back to the Altitude Centre for retesting, and then again, retesting at sea level in Bristol two days later. The key metric we'd be looking at would be my average power for a full gas 20 minute effort on the watt bike. It's a classic test and a pretty good indicator of any improvements in overall fitness. Obviously, I was expecting my watts to go up just due to having a training plan set for me, but I was gonna be curious to see whether they would go up even more than expected due to the hypoxic training. Before those baseline tests at the Altitude Centre in London, I was told by Altitude Centre guru Nick Hart that I was going to have to go really deep and that it was going to hurt a lot. Having done plenty of 20 minute threshold tests in my time, I can safely say that doing it at a simulated 2,700 metres was by far the most painful one I've ever done. I was told that pacing was going to be crucial due to the lack of oxygen I was going to be breathing, so I had to set off quite carefully. Even then, in the final few minutes of the test, I hit 198 BPM, which I haven't seen for a long time. Once I recovered, my results were 286 watts for 64 kilos for 20 minutes. Not bad, but that's a lot less than I'd usually expect to see and shows how much difference that lack of oxygen makes. By comparison, the test at sea level in Bristol was a lot easier to pace and I finished with numbers of 324 watts for 20 minutes, again at 64 kilos. The team at the Altitude Centre stressed that I should be pushing myself hard when using the hypoxic generator. So it was no surprise that Tom had set me a demanding training plan with plenty of intervals throughout the week. 
On average, I trained 10 to 8 hours per week with three one-hour sessions on the hypoxic generator. The rest of the time was at sea level, out on the roads, doing my regular training. Just like the initial test in London, I found the first couple of weeks of using the hypoxic generator at home incredibly difficult and demanding. With less O2 to work with, you just have to be so careful not to kind of go into the red or to overdo it during those sessions because once you'd gone too deep, there was just no recovery, no turning back. And a few times in those first couple of weeks, I ended up just as a breathless mess because I'd gone too hard during those intervals and I'd paid for it dearly. Also, it was just strange matching my perceived exertion with the watts that I was seeing. I was often seeing watts that would usually be around tempo at sea level, but at altitude, those watts were kind of upper zone four and feel really difficult and kind of getting your head around that initially is quite weird. However, after a few weeks, there was a definite shift in kind of my perceived exertion while doing the efforts. Granted, it was still really tough. and A lot of afternoons at work, I'd spend dreading what I had in store for me that night, but I felt like I had just a little bit more control of how hard I could push during the intervals. From then on, it felt like I was starting to adapt to the demands of the training. The rest of the six weeks passed pretty smoothly. Having a full-time job and living in the real world, I did miss a couple of sessions, but on the whole, I felt like I completed the plan and the experiment as thoroughly as I could. On the day of the first retest at the Altitude Centre in London, I was pretty nervous because knowing how deep I'd gone before and knowing I was going to have to go that deep again and that I really wanted to beat my 286 watt score from the six weeks previously. Yeah, it was a pretty um, daunting proposition as I got the train down to London. During the test, I felt like I was able to pace it a bit better. My heart rate didn't rise as far and I finished giving everything I had again with a score of 310 watts for 20 minutes. Two days later in Bristol, at sea level, the test revealed a similar improvement and I did 354 watts for 20 minutes. So the improvement at altitude was 24 watts and the improvement at sea level was 30 watts. Not too shabby over six weeks. It's clear to see I made a real improvement over the six week period. Both my watts at altitude and at sea level increased. I was particularly impressed by the improvement at sea level because 354 watts for 20 minutes is a personal record on a watt bike and I don't see personal records very often anymore. I'm cautious to draw any real concrete conclusions from the results. Obviously it's hard to say whether the improvement was down to solely the hypoxic training or down to the training plan I had set by Tom or more likely a combination of the two. Also as I'm only one rider what worked for me might not work for someone else in an ideal world, you'd have multiple riders following lots of different training plans to see if the hypoxic training really made the difference. That being said, there were a couple of observations which made me think that perhaps the hypoxic generator did have some benefit. Although the training was demanding, the hours and intervals I had set by top were probably less than I'd usually expect to do around the time of year that the testing took place, which was December to February. Seeing such a decent improvement on my watts on a relatively modest amount of training for me and over such a short period of time suggests that the hypoxic training could have helped. The training at sea level out on the roads which I had set by Tom also included plenty of hill reps and intervals. They were pretty demanding, often kind of six, eight minute hill reps, but I found that I was consistently hitting the wattage targets in the last four weeks of the six week period. So again, this could have been down to my body becoming more efficient because I've been using the hypoxic generator, but I can't say for sure. Finally, I've been training with power meters since 2010, so I have a really intimate knowledge of kind of what training works for me and what numbers I expect to see when I'm going well and how long it takes to hit those numbers. These days, hitting record numbers is a real rarity just because I've been training with power for so long, yet that's exactly what I did on that final sea level test. Without true scientific data, I can't say for certain what caused this improvement. Was it the hypoxic generator? Was it Tom's training plan? Or a combination of both? I'm inclined to think a combination of both, but again, there's no way to know for sure. So Joe's training period with the hypoxic generator did show us some intriguing results. And though far from being scientifically controlled, we did see Joe's performance improve at simulated altitude as well as sea level at a faster rate than he'd seen in the past, even though the weekly TSS or the training stress score values 
were lower than he'd done in previous trading blocks. Whether this was down to the hypoxic intervention, the increase in training structure, or perhaps more indoor riding time leading to more efficient training, that's hard to say, but we did see a solid improvement nevertheless. From a training perspective, what we did is follow as many best practices as we could, and we were careful to periodize the plan to allow for sustainable progression of fitness. We aimed for a couple of hypoxic sessions per week, a long endurance ride and then some structured interval training that didn't include the generator. Essentially we tried to use a training program that many riders could mimic and manage alongside a full-time job and other life commitments, yet still take advantage of the benefits that hypoxic training can bring. Overall I think we were pretty pleased with Joe's fitness and performance improvement in this relatively short training period. From the start I realised that this test was never going to provide me with a definitive answer to the question of does altitude training make you faster? With just one rider, me, and without all of the scientific controls we could have available to us, the results were always going to be difficult to draw any real conclusions from. But what I can say for certain is that the combination of the hypoxic training and Tom's training plan made me faster than I've ever been at sea level. And I was pretty happy with that, you know, I can't complain. Please let me know what you think in the comments about the test and if you've got any questions or if there's anything I haven't been clear on, let me know and I'll do my best to answer them.